All right. I tested the mic. So. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Way to go, Liz. Liz said good morning. Guys, thank you. <laughs> good morning and welcome. Um, thank you all very much for coming out this morning and joining us, as well as we do have a virtual audience. Thank you to everyone out there in Zoom joining us as well. If we haven't met, my name is Donna Morris, and I serve as the president of the Greater Salem Chamber of Commerce. But today I'm actually wearing a different hat. I am wearing my member of what we call the Commerce Corridor uh, Chambers of Commerce. And I'd like to take a minute. This is a group of seven fantastic chambers in the state of New Hampshire. We border the southern border of New Hampshire all the way up to the capital. So I would like to introduce my peers in the room today that helped make this event possible. We have Tim Sink from the Greater Concord Chamber, Wendy Hunt from the Greater Nashua Chamber, Liz. Calibria from the Merrimack Sauhegan Valley Chamber, Ashley Hazeltine, who is also our Zoom chat monitor from the Derry London Dairy Chamber, Heather McGrill from the Manchester, Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, and Brenda Collins from the Greater Hudson Chamber of Commerce. So thank you very much to all of you. Okay. So while, while this might look like a political event, <laughs> event, I need to remind everyone that Chambers of Commerce are nonpartisan, and this is in fact an informational event. The, um, the money that is coming from the Infrastructure and Improvement Jobs Act is significant, and there's gonna be some impact in the state of New Hampshire. So this is an informational event, and if we have any trouble reminding our audience of that, we have the very seasoned Mike Warren, who will be our moderator for today. <laughs> Mike comes to us with over 50 years of broadcast experience, as well as he's the author of several books and was a newspaper columnist for years. So we are in good hands. Mike's gonna give us an overview of how the event will go today, as well as a little information about how you can ask questions of the senators. And thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just gonna hand it over to Mike. Okay. I'm, Nicely I'm doing done. a mic drop. Okay. Yeah, I'm a pretty imposing figure, so no funny business out there, folks. I will take you down. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 50 years is a long time doing radio, but one of the nice things about looking back is some of the people you get to have as regular guests, including these two terrific senators. Uh, and they added, you both added a nice level of comfort during COVID, at least in the, in the early stages, because you were regulars on my show on Frank FM and, and before that at WZID. And it was nice that you were so available and so willing to just kind of hold our hands, it's gonna be okay. I mean, there was no vaccines then, but, but you, you shared what we should all be doing. So thank you for, over the years, I mean, 20 years when you were both governors, you were on my shows, and now here you are. You're the, dating us, Mike. Uh, <laughs> indeed, all That's of us. all right. I, I just turned 71, so I don't wanna hear any of the saging thing here. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, again, for being here today. And yes, as Donna said, I will give you a quick rundown on what's gonna happen, and then I will turn it over to uh, Senators Shaheen and Hassan. So uh, we will begin with opening uh, comments very shortly from, from both of our senators. And then we're gonna hear uh, a bit of a legislation overview via Zoom that you will not see. It'll be audio only. This, the uh, speakers are mounted in the ceiling. You'll be able to hear everything just fine. You just won't see people. Uh, and following that, which will, and they're in Washington, then we turn it local into this room here. You have cards on your tables, and uh, I would actually recommend that you start thinking of your questions now because this is gonna be a very quick session and we want everybody who has a question at least have a chance. You will not be asked to speak. The questions will be handed to somebody, a number of people, they'll bring it up to me and then I will read it for the senators to respond to. And, uh, and, and that's, that's pretty much it. It's, it's really simple, it's, it's informational, it's respectful, and I think, uh, we are ready to get things underway with opening statements. We'll begin with our senior senator from the Granite State, Senator, and let's give a round of applause. If we, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Shaheen, you're up first. Well, thanks very much, Mike, and thank you to Donna and to every, all of the leaders of the New Hampshire Commerce Corridor Chambers. Um, it's a great partnership that I think started during COVID and has been very successful. So thank you for continuing that. I um, also want to thank St. A's and the Institute of Politics here, Neil Levesque, for hosting us this morning. And to all of you for being here. It is so nice to be in person um, with the option of wearing masks so we can take them off and actually see faces for um, many people. So that's really wonderful and I appreciate it the chance to be here with all of you and to be here with my colleague, Senator Hassan. Uh, you know, 
We're going to have a presentation, and I think for many of you there are slides on the tables of the presentation that our, my staff is going to do in a little while. But I really wanted to start with what's happening with Russia's war in Ukraine, because that is ha going to have a global impact. The President referenced it to some extent in the State of the Union the other night. He talked about the potential impact on our global economy, and we're already seeing that in so many ways. But, you know, this is a moment, I think, very much like the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall, where the world comes together and looks at the choice that we have for our future. And we see that juxtaposed very clearly in Ukraine right now, where we have an aspiring democracy in Ukraine, where we have all been so inspired by the courage of the Ukrainian people as they stand up to try and determine their own future. They want freedom. They want to look to the West. They want to be part of Europe. And opposing that is Russia and Vladimir Putin, a dictatorship where people are arrested because they demonstrate where all of the media, the free media has been shut down, where people don't have freedom of movement, where we see Russians fleeing the country instead of fleeing to get in to the country. And it, it is one of those moments where I think uh, the world looks at the choice that we have and it's important to us because as we look at what's happened globally in the last couple of decades, we've seen democracies on the decline and autocracies on the rise. And what this points out so clearly is that people are looking at those choices and saying, no, I, I, want, I want to be in a democracy. I want to be able to determine my own future. I want to have opportunities, and I want to be free, and I want to be able to demonstrate and watch what media I want to watch and read what newspaper I want to read and get the kind of job that will be open to me. And so it's a really important time, and I get asked a lot, why, what difference does what's happening in Ukraine make for America and for us in New Hampshire? And I think that is the difference that it makes for us. It is about the kind of choices we make, and I have been so heartened by the world coming together in support of Ukraine, where everything from New Hampshire refusing to buy Russian vodka to athletes who say, I'm not going to participate in athletic events in Russia, to, of course, the sanctions, which are really crippling at this point against Vladimir Putin. But I start with this because I, I do think it's a critical time for all of us to think about our future. Um, but it's also going to have an impact on our economy, as I said. It's already having that impact. It's exacerbating some of the supply chain issues. Um, we're seeing the impact at the pump right now. And so we need to think about the fact that we're all going to be asked to sacrifice in this moment um, for our futures and for the future of our country and the future of Western democracy. And it's not going to always be easy, although I looked at the job numbers this morning and the jobs numbers are good um, for the last month and unemployment is down below 4 percent, it's at 3.8 percent. But this is a tough time, as we know, and people are still coming out of COVID and um, feeling challenged by what's happening right now. And so it's, as leaders in your communities, um, you have a real responsibility at this moment to take up that mantle of leadership and continue to support um, the efforts that you have been part of as part of this chamber that you've been part of in New Hampshire and, and in the country. And so I hope that we will all think about what we can do at this time to show that leadership that our communities and our country so desperately need. So um, I, again, I wanted to start with that because I think it is so critical and will have such an impact on what happens next as we look at this Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is the reason we're all here and um, is the biggest investment in infrastructure in my lifetime that we've seen. And 
Um, Senator Hassan and I worked on getting that bill negotiated, and it's $550 billion. Um, we're going to have staff who are going to run through it in a little while. But um, it makes those investments that we have not been making in um, the last couple of decades. And as I looked at infrastructure, we had been, until this bill, been investing less in infrastructure in the 2000s than we were investing in 1960s. So clearly we have a backlog and we need to address it. And that's what this bill is all about. And it's critical to our families, to our communities, but it's also critical if we're gonna be competitive as a country. And one of the um, important things about this moment as we look at what's happening with the war in Ukraine is it's not just democracies, our allies, who are really looking at what's happening. It's our adversaries who are looking at what's happening. And right now we know China is investing more in infrastructure than we are, and they're our biggest competitor. So this is an opportunity for us to look at where we can invest those dollars to prepare our communities, to prepare New Hampshire for the future. And that, for me, is one of the most exciting things about it. I was up in Newport last summer, and we were talking, we hadn't passed the bill yet, and um, we were talking about what was needed in Newport, where they have 100-year-old pipes that have lead in them, and they're worried about whether they're going to be able to continue to provide clean water for people. And the Newport town manager told me that we need a bill of this size every year for the next 10 years in order to address the backlog. So I don't think we're going to get that, but I do think it's an indication of just how much, how critical these dollars are and how important they're going to be to our future. Um, so one of the, as I'm sure you're aware, one of the things this bill does is to invest in um, energy, in our energy infrastructure and in energy efficiency in ways that are going to be really critical as we look at um, how we respond to the situation in Ukraine. There's funding for electric vehicles, for charging stations, for buses, for mass transit, and for energy efficiency, the demand side of energy in a way that we haven't done in a very long time. Energy efficiency is something that I've worked on and it's exciting to see six billion dollars that can go for weatherization and efficiency in ways that we haven't seen in the past. So that's going to be very important. Um, also, the resilience pieces of the legislation that provide um, a down payment, really, on addressing climate change in ways that we need to um, as we look at the challenges that communities, particularly in the seacoast and um, the North Country, are facing with respect to climate change. So I'm not going to go through the pieces of the bill um, one by one because the staff is going to do that in a few minutes and I'm sure we'll get into those with your questions. But um, as an overview, this is a really exciting opportunity for all of us as we think about how we can make the investments we need to to stay competitive in our communities and in our country. So thank you all very much. And I think I'm supposed to introduce my colleague, Senator Hassan, next. Well, thank you, Senator Shaheen, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, it is nice, indeed, to see everybody in person without masks on. And to Mike Morin, uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate and keep us all in line today. To all of the business leaders here, thank you for what you do, um, not only in your individual businesses, but the business community steps up and really makes sure that uh, we are together as communities in so many different ways. So I just um, am really, really grateful to all of you for everything you did to keep things going during the pandemic in particular. Um, one of the things I've been able to do um, throughout the pandemic is really just point to the very different, all the different ways that people in New Hampshire have stepped up and helped each other. And uh, you guys have been a critical part of that. So thank you. And a thank you as well uh, to St. A's for hosting us. 
um, and to the Commerce Corridor, not only for hosting this discussion, but for all that you've done on behalf of businesses in New Hampshire. You know, having all of these chambers together really does make a difference, especially uh, when there are so many things happening in the world, so many uh, things to keep track of, even with uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. You're all, you know, this organization is making a true difference. Um, I wanted to just also um, add a, a, my thoughts a little bit on the situation in Ukraine right now. Uh, and just to echo what Jean said about the importance of us all standing together. Um, I was raised by a World War II veteran. My dad fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, there are a lot of lessons he drew for the, from that uh, that he worked very hard to pass on to his three kids, one of which is that the United States of America can do anything it sets its mind to, including um, free the world from a fascist dictator like Hitler. Um, but the other lesson was the importance of standing for freedom. And uh, dad would say to us at the breakfast table, what are you guys gonna do for freedom today? Which sounds kind of like an audacious thing to ask school age kids. Um, but it was his way of pointing out that in a democracy, it's up to each and every one of us to do that. And so um, this is a moment in time where we really do need to be standing with uh, the people of Ukraine, but with democracies everywhere, because the other lesson that my father wanted to make sure his children knew was that if you appease a dictator early, they will keep going. Um, nobody is safe from Putin if Ukraine isn't safe from Putin. Uh, and so we know that uh, there will be very difficult days ahead, but we also know that the free world uh, led by the United States, led by our allies together, is capable of standing up to him and winning this fight in the long run. And that's what this is about. Um, Jean and I both know, too, that we will have to work uh, to mitigate some of the impact of the sanctions, as, as she just talked about. One of the things we've both worked on is uh, pushing the administration to release more oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, for instance. Uh, there's more actual capacity in the private market right now that they can tap into, so we, we need the private sector to uh, step up too. Um, and we'll continue to do other things to work to lower costs for Americans as we're going through uh, this difficult time, as we're coming through the pandemic. Uh, but it is really uh, important, uh, and I think we've already seen the impact of um, unity uh, from the free world. Putin did not expect this, uh, and this is not going the way he planned, um, and that's a very important first step. Um, I want to just talk a little bit, um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the infrastructure bill, but I also just want to talk about kind of the next thing we're all working on um, in terms of supply chains. Um, obviously, uh, the infrastructure bill um, huge investment, game-changing uh, for New Hampshire in any number of ways. Um, but we also know that there are new challenges that businesses um, have been facing, and I just want to focus on a couple of the things that we've been doing, particularly around supply chains. Uh, we know we have to strengthen our supply chains, um, and not only for our own uh, self-sufficiency, but also uh, to make sure we can outcompete China or any other uh, competitor on the global stage. So while we're all focused on implementing the infrastructure bill and the kind of oversight that's going to be needed to do that effectively, I'm also working with colleagues to craft and pass a comprehensive bipartisan act, uh, package that would make major investments in American R&D and in manufacturing. Um, I'm specifically focused on making sure that U.S. companies produce critical goods such as semiconductors, military technology, medical devices, solar panels, things like that. These are critical sectors where we know, especially some of the lessons of the last two years have been uh, that uh, supply chain interruptions impact um, our economy, impact our quality of life when we're not making things here in the United States um, ourselves. So um, investing in that is critical. Um, investing in infrastructure uh, has also obviously been a really important step forward because that is the foundation uh, for economic growth. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, a couple of the things I worked on in particular, and then we'll get to the staff presentation. 
Um, I worked with Senator Shaheen, as well as our colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to negotiate the legislation and a couple of the priorities that I've been hearing about from Granite Staters for a long time um, include investments in our country's ports, dams, and waterways, um, as well as critical investments in high-speed internet. Um, you know, um, Senator Shaheen talked about her conversations with people in Newport about replacing pipes. Um, I still remember the mayor of Berlin, uh, Paul Grenier, saying to me, high-speed internet, that's like a super highway for us. If you can do that, it just opens up all these possibilities. So uh, my staff and I work very uh, particularly, as did Jean's, on the high-speed speed internet. Um, but we also worked on ports, um, dams, and waterways. And last month, we were both at the Portsmouth Harbor, um, which, as you all know, is really important for facilitating the flow of goods from and through New Hampshire and impacts our supply chain. Because of the infrastructure law, uh, the harbor will receive more than one and a half million dollars to help improve the safety and efficiency of the waterways, including widening that turning basin. You know, you have to have an adequate space to turn really, really large ships. Um, so the money is helping with, helping with that, uh, with uh, main, maintaining dredging, which makes sure that the space, the waterway is efficient. Um, and ultimately, this is about bringing in larger ships to our port which carry more supplies, uh, which helps ease some of our log jams. That's just one of the ways that this infrastructure law is going to help ease some of the supply chain bottlenecks. Um, and uh, it's also going to help us better prepare for future disruptions to our supply chains and to the global economy. Uh, there is a lot more work to do. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we've turned from focus on, on this to also just making sure that we can have the kind of self-sufficient uh, manufacturing uh, economy here at home uh, that will stand us in good stead moving forward. Uh, these, all, all of these um, areas, whether it's infrastructure or supply chains, um, are appropriately getting a lot of attention from both sides of the aisle because we're all hearing from our constituents how important this is. Uh, to our businesses, how important it is to our quality of life, and especially um, in light of what's happening uh, in Ukraine, how important it is to our capacity to lead. Um, so thanks, everybody, for having us here this morning. And uh, I'll now turn it back over to our, our moderator. Right. Thank you, Senators. And, and I think everybody appreciates addressing the Ukraine situation. It's on everybody's mind, and, and you tied it together, Senator Shaheen how it's going to affect us all, even though we're thousands of miles away. So I think I speak on behalf of our group here to, to thank you both for that. All right, now members of Senator Shaheen's legislative team are joining us virtually. Again, you will not see it. It's a Zoom connection, but it will not be uh, visual. It's just audio. They'll go into the details of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provisions and what it means for New Hampshire. I have a lot of cards here. So uh, I'll be going through these, and, and when your staff is finished with their presentation, uh, I will then address you with those. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and just to remind you, most tables, I think, have slides that will be what they'll use as the, um, the guide as they're walking through what's in this infrastructure package. So if you don't have them, we're passing some more out. Great. And can everybody hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. we can Great. hear you, Ted. Great. This, this is, is yeah. Ted Trippy, who works on infrastructure in my office in Washington. Excellent. I appreciate it. Um, I'm sharing uh, my screen for folks uh, that are joined virtually, so hopefully you all can see. But if not, uh, please do follow along with the slides that we provided you by email. I'll just give one more second for folks to get ready there. Okay, so I uh, wanted to start off with the uh, funding for roads, bridges, and transit. Uh, there's $351 billion to repair and rebuild roads and bridges, expand bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, improve roadway safety, and jumpstart other major projects. Uh, but there's also $108 billion for public transportation. Uh, the bill includes $300 billion in state formula grants, as well as funding for EV charging. So as you know, uh, there's about $5 billion in formula funds for uh, states to build out EV, EV charging stations. 
uh, and 2.5 billion available through competitive grants for the same purpose. Uh, there's $8.7 billion split up between formula funds and competitive funds uh, for resilience through the Protect Grant Program. And that program's designed essentially to build in resilience to our infrastructure assets uh, to make sure that we're prepared for the impacts of climate change. Uh, for bridges, there's $40 billion to repair and rebuild bridges. Uh, this includes, uh, well, New Hampshire has received $45 million uh, for the first year of that funding. Uh, there's also $7.2 billion included for pedestrian and low emission transportation choices through the Transportation Alternatives Program. Uh, this is all on top of $100 billion essentially for new uh, grant programs that are going to be offered through the Department of Transportation. And so we have uh, provided all participants uh, with a comprehensive guide uh, regarding all grant opportunities, both competitive and formula. Uh, so please do refer to that guide to see, for instance, uh, program descriptions, eligible applicants, eligible project types, uh, and all other information to see if a, if a project or a program looks right for you. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So this is a, a particular provision that uh, Senator Shaheen, our office has worked on for quite a while here. Um, and it provides a, a marketplace for the trade of toll credits. And so uh, states accrue toll credits or essentially earn toll credits from the Federal Highway Administration uh, when, uh, when they use revenues from toll facilities to benefit the uh, interstate highway system. And so uh, what happens is those, those toll credits can essentially go towards um, federal match requirements for, for federally funded of uh, transportation projects. However, uh, in the case of New Hampshire and for many other states, there is uh, a accrued over $200 million uh, for New Hampshire uh, in toll credits. And that money is basically just sitting there. Uh, there hasn't been enough federal aid projects to put that money towards. And so it's basically unrealized uh, value. And so the point of the marketplace is that states like New Hampshire can sell these toll credits uh, uh, to states that need them. Uh, and and earn revenue from those to, from those sales and put that revenue towards state-led uh, transportation projects uh, and basically contribute to a net growth in the total investment uh, in transportation projects across the state. Uh, moving on to the next slide, and I'm going to leave this to uh, our, my colleague Janelle Deluja to uh, talk about water water and wastewater infrastructure. Thanks so much, Ted. Um, I'm Janelle Delusha. I'm Senator Shaheen's Energy and Environment Policy Advisor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I'm going to run through some of the water infrastructure provisions from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And Senator Shaheen helped ne lead negotiations on this piece of the bill with Senator Romney. So there's a lot of uh, Granite State priorities that were kept foremost in mind as we negotiated this part of the bill. Um, so in total, there is about $55 billion in new water infrastructure spending over the next five years. That's on top of the expected continuation and appropriations for the um, state revolving funds for drinking water and clean water. So in total, we've got about $70 billion going into our water infrastructure over the next five years. So that the bulk of that money is gonna come through the, the state revolving funds, the drinking water state revolving fund and the clean water state revolving fund. And the reason for that, um, you know, the senators as they negotiated the bill wanted to make sure that states and communities were able to get this funding and able to use it. So we're using the you know, longstanding, well-worn uh, process of the state revolving fund. And there's also specific funding set aside within that for lead pipe replacement and specifically for addressing emerging contaminants like PFAS that have been such a problem in New Hampshire. So in December, EPA announced that um, the state allocations for the first year of that funding and New Hampshire is receiving about $72 million. For context, um, with regular appropriations, we got uh, $27 million between the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Fund last year. And those, are gonna, those appropriations are gonna continue. So we're really looking at about triple the investment each year in New Hampshire on our water infrastructure, which is just so important. And I wanted to note a couple of the, the specific um, ways we treated that funding in the infrastructure bill to make it easier to use and to get on the ground in New Hampshire. 
And specifically for the funding for the first two years, the state match is lowered. We're putting a lot of new investment in here and that, you know, that, that's gonna put some pressure on folks to, to come up with matches. So we've lowered it on the state and specifically for lead pipes and PFAS grants, we've lowered it even further for communities. 100% of the funding that can be used for emerging contaminants and PFAS is gonna be available to communities as grants uh, or loans with 100% forgiveness. So really meaningful for getting that funding onto the ground. And lead pipes, about half of that is gonna be able to be used um, with, no, um, with no state match. So we're really trying to emphasize these pri particular priorities uh, for public health, um, along with the significantly increasing the regular infrastructure funding. Overall, the bill also reauthorizes a number of important clean water and safe drinking water programs. Um, and as you all know better than most, um, access to clean water, safe drinking water is, is not only important for our quality of life, but it's also economic development. And another piece of the water infrastructure there, um, the construction and native con contribution to native construction um, tax fix, I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Robert Henson, because that one is just so important for, for economic development. Thanks, Janelle. Um, my name is Robert Henson. I handle tax issues for Senator Shaheen. Um, so folks in the room may be aware, um, historically, uh, Section 118 of the Internal Revenue Code provided uh, favorable tax treatment for so-called uh, contributions in aid of construction, or CIAC, uh, to encourage companies to donate property or money for the benefit of the community at large. Oftentimes, this would be capital contributed by a developer to a utility for use in expanding or upgrading uh, service territory. Um, for example, a home builder might make payments of, of CIAC either in the form of money or newly constructed uh, physical water infrastructure to a local water company to enable that company to expand its service territory to cover the buildings, uh, building developments, uh, new, new, uh, new ground. Um, unfortunately, in, in 2017, in the, in the 2017 tax bill, uh, eliminated this, this tax exemption for, for water utilities uh, and made an additional change by eliminating the tax-free treatment of capital contributions made by governmental uh, entities or civic groups, such as the um, Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund, um, as well as municipal governments that wanted to make investments in water or other infrastructure in partnership with private developers. Uh, and so this change in the 2017 tax bill uh, impacted the ability of communities to use, uh, also use tax increment financing. Um, so the practical consequence of these changes uh, was that water companies uh, prior to passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act would incur tax liability upon receipt of uh, a CIAC, a contribution to native construction, and regulatory rules generally uh, require water companies uh, to pass that cost back on to the payer of the contribution. Um, in, in other words, to the private developer that funded the infrastructure investment in the, in the first place. Uh, and in, oftentimes, in some instances, those costs ultimately are passed downstream uh, in the form of higher utility costs for, for rate payers. Um, and so Senator Sheen has been working on this uh, for a number of years now to try and address this. Um, we heard initially from uh, uh, communities in southern New Hampshire uh, where this change in the 2017 tax bill resulted in at least $1.15 million in new federal taxes for water infrastructure projects in southern New Hampshire. Um, and so we were successful in, in including this, uh, a, a change to this or a fix for this uh, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, so that now, uh, once again, uh, as historically has been the case, uh, these contributions to of construction uh, are no longer taxable uh, income for the developers or for the water companies, which, uh, again, it's a relatively small change in terms of the entire scope of this legislation, but it's a really important one because uh, we've heard from communities in New Hampshire that this has dramatically increased the cost of making improvements to water infrastructure. And uh, so hopefully this, this ongoing uh, change will, um, you know, at, at least at the margins, uh, lower the cost of some of these investments uh, going forward. And if that's next slide, I think, Ted. So I'll just run through uh, the broadband section very quickly. Um, uh, as you know, there's 65 billion provided for broadband. Of that 65 billion, the large chunk is going to be the 42.45 billion for deployment grants. Uh, that deployment uh, grant program will run through the states uh, administering it, and states will have to develop plans essentially that will be approved by the National Telecommunications and, and Information Administration in order to uh, receive their deployment funds and go on uh, uh, making sub-grants for deployment projects. 
Uh, going forward, there's a, the affordable connectivity benefit. This is 14.2 billion for, uh, for uh, the affordable connectivity benefit to ensure that low income families have access to reliable high speed internet. This is a building off of the EVB program and essentially provides a voucher for uh, program participants to uh, receive discounted internet service. There's 1 billion provided for middle mile uh, build out projects. Uh, there's 2 billion provided for the USDA reconnect program to serve especially uh, low connected uh, rural areas. There's $600 billion uh, through private expanding private activity bonds to um, broadband projects. That was a particular item led by Senator Hassan's office. Uh, there's the Digital Equity Act, which is uh, for uh, funding for digital access and literacy programs. And then there's $2 billion provided to the Tribal uh, Broadband Connectivity uh, Program. And that concludes our presentation. As I said, we will be providing documents that uh, provide uh, information about all grant funds available uh, uh, through this through this law thank you all and i think ted you missed the mass transit section but we won't go through that but i will just call your attention to that i think that's the second page after the transportation um and i know that rail is of particular interest to the yep. commerce quarter chamber first so questions. yes <laughs> yep. so there's 66 billion for to address amtrak's backlog um, and if you look at that second page, you'll see where the other um, dollars are broken out in terms of mass transit. It's, it's the biggest investment in mass transit, I think, ever in the country's history in the bill. And, and there's also uh, the capital investment grant program, which we worked on to make sure, you know, that the capital corridor project, the Boston to Concord uh, concept of passenger rail that uh, communities in the state have been working on uh, for quite some time uh, could have kind of two options under this infrastructure bill. One is to become part of an expansion of Amtrak that Jean just referenced, the, the additional funding there. The other is through the Capital Investment Grant Program. And one of the things we really focused on in negotiating this piece was making sure that relatively smaller projects like our Capital Corridor Project would qualify for that. So uh, that's a competitive program. Um, but that gives the Capital Corridor Project kind of two different places to try to go to make sure uh, that we can get it funded. And um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting time uh, for all of the advocates, uh, particularly in this part of the state, who've been working on that for so long. That would be a real game changer for New Hampshire. Well, uh, you, you basically covered two, the first two questions I had on the card. So uh, for those that, that submitted questions about the Capital Corridor Rail project, you got, you got some answers from, uh, from the senators there. All right, here is another one. What will be the process for submitting project proposals, especially for smaller towns that have a hard time competing for funding? How do you help these smaller communities? Well, that's why we tried to provide some background and we're working with the municipal association and virtually every town in the state to try and make sure people understand when the grant proposals, uh, opportunities come out that people know where to go to get the information um, and what is required. The other thing that I would point out, um, because all of that is very specific based on what towns need and want and um, how the grant programs are um, structured. But the other issue that we started again this year in the appropriations process that has some real hope for communities that have not been able to get projects funded is we are now doing congressionally directed spending, also known as earmarks, um, which is I think really important, particularly in small states like ours, where often because of the way the formulas are structured, we're at the bottom in terms of being able to get help. And particularly for small communities, for small projects, for things that don't fit neatly into those um, I items, um, those earmarks, congressionally directed spending projects, are really important. And so we have a number of those coming assuming we're going to be able to get the omnibus budget done for the rest of this year, we have a number of those projects coming to New Hampshire communities all over the state um, that are really important. So there are really a couple of opportunities that communities will have, and we're about ready to notice, I don't know where Sarah Holmes is, but over there, my state director, we're about ready to notice, I think, in the next couple of weeks, um, the um, applications for 
asking about um, those congressionally directed spending amounts. So um, watch for those as well as the contract and um, projects that are coming out. And, and I'll just add that because I am chair of a subcommittee called Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight, um, because this is the first year in a long time that there have been these congressionally directed spending priorities, um, I am not participating in that application process because I have this subcommittee role of oversight, uh, but Jean's office obviously is, and so Sarah's a, Sarah and her staff are very good resources, but it just seemed to me that I needed to focus on the oversight part of this as we were starting this new kind of uh, spending. We've uh, seen a lot of uh, success, a lot of uh, things going well in the Commerce Corridor, but along with that financial success for businesses is certainly a lack of affordable housing. So I don't know if we can tie it all together with what we're discussing today, but I have a couple. So that tells me that there's more than just a few people that are concerned about that. And I'll, I'll read these both and you can, you can uh, go with it. Vacancy rates are exceptionally low. Rents are rising in New Hampshire. What additional help can the federal government provide? And along those lines, my employees in many cases are struggling finding housing in southern New Hampshire. I have several homeless, not necessarily because of money, but availability. So is there any, uh, I guess, encouragement that we can offer on, on those terms? Sure. Uh, uh, so this is the issue that I probably hear most about from uh, business leaders and community members all across the state. Uh, it's an issue that I heard about before the pandemic. It's an issue that I'm hearing now. Um, in addition to supporting uh, expansions of the low income tax credit, for instance, um, and other critical resources, I think the infrastructure bill has a number of provisions that are really, really important when it comes to being able to expand um, our housing stock in New Hampshire. One of them is the clean water provisions. Um, I was out, uh, I'm forgetting how recently ago, but I was uh, with um, community leaders in Epping uh, just a couple of months ago as they showed me some of their new, uh, their upgraded uh, clean water uh, technology, which cost that town $4 million. Uh, they've got an affordable housing um, complex that they would like to uh, invest in, a workforce housing complex, but they don't have the water infrastructure to do it. Similarly, I am hearing uh, in community after community that it's hard to build houses or sell houses in areas of the state uh, where you don't have high-speed internet. Uh, that's kind of the number one question that, that buyers are gonna ask. So um, in both those cases, this kind of investment in infrastructure along with uh, roads, bridges, passenger rail, I think really provide more incentives, but ultimately we have more work to do uh, to make sure that we um, are providing the kind of incentives for um, workforce housing development in particular as we can increase that stock. Uh, that obviously uh, improves the vacancy rate and helps stabilize prices. Yeah, and I would echo what um, Maggie said about this being a huge need, <coughs> excuse me, that existed even before COVID. Um, one of the things we tried to do in the American Rescue Plan um, which was passed last year, was to provide for rental assistance help for um, people who might be facing eviction, but also for landlords so that they were not um, sitting there with um, empty apartments or housing, <clears throat> and also for mortgage assistance. And the state is still working on that. <clears throat> getting choked up because I, I think we've not made as much progress on this area as I would like. <laughs> but so for example, last April, almost a year ago, the state got $5 million to come up with a housing plan to help with mortgage assistance. Um, they are still waiting to get that approved because they have been so slow. So there is significant, there's, you know, $50 million here to help with mortgage assistance for families so they can stay in their homes. And we have not gotten that money out in the way that we need to to help people who need it. Um, I know the governor in his um, State of the State address just announced funding to help with housing um, because under the American Rescue Plan, the state has got about almost $600 million 
that has not been obligated yet for anything. And I know in Maine, they've allocated about 100 million for housing, um, the same in Vermont. Um, Massachusetts has been more because they got more money, obviously. But this is a place where the state has money because of the federal dollars that are coming that we need to make sure gets used. And I know that all of you, um, because this is such a big issue for business and for workforce, um, have an interest in this. So I hope you will urge your legislators and urge uh, the governor to get that money out to make sure people get the help they need. Long term, we've got to do more. As Maggie said, the low income tax credit to provide help for developers is really important, but we've got to look at how we can make sure that the flexibility is there to use dollars that are coming from these various pots of money um, for communities to help with affordable housing as well. And a, a couple of other things just to have on your radar. Um, I've got a bipartisan bill in with Senator Blunt that would help restore um, and make permanent um, the mortgage insurance deduction uh, for you know low and middle income uh, homeowners who have to put up more than that 20% of a, a deposit on a house um, and have to get mortgage insurance. Just trying to make the affordability pieces of this um, a little bit easier, a little bit better. Um, and so that's another area. And the other thing we've been uh, trying to establish a pilot program, and this is more towards rental housing, but a lot of the um, evictions that occur in rental housing happen over a relatively small amount of money. Uh, a renter can't quite meet the rent for a couple of months in a row, and the eviction process begins. And overall, the eviction churn is bad for renters and it's bad for landlords. Um, and so there's a lot of work being done around mediation programs that can really help uh, figure out how to stabilize um, that experience as well. So people don't need to get evicted, they can get on a plan, they can make their landlord whole. Um, and sometimes it just really takes um, a good mediation process to do it. So we're trying to address this from a variety of different directions. But it, and and uh, I, I think the other thing that um, I hear a lot about from um, developers is just trying to streamline the approval process at the local level in a way that still respects the local community's power to decide what's being built in their uh, community, but do it in a more streamlined way so that uh, developers aren't uh, losing the time that equals dollars, right? And that incentivizes them to build more expensive housing. Thank you. A couple questions having to do with uh, transportation. And by the way, we've got maybe eight, nine minutes left. So if you do have a question uh, not related to anything you've heard already, it's not too late to, to get up here to me. Energy costs are driving inflation and causing much pain at the pump. I know, 66 bucks for me to fill up this morning on the Daniel Webster Highway in Nashua. And I know I'm not alone, right? Everybody is seeing it. Uh, is there any appetite in Washington to ramp up domestic production? Boy, there ought to be <laughs> appetite to ramp up domestic production. What we've been seeing, unfortunately, over the last months is um, oil companies that have limited production because they want to keep the prices high. So I think what we've got to look at, and there are several pieces of legislation. I know we just heard from the, the head of the Federal Trade Commission yesterday, and she heard an earful from all of us about the need to take a look at what the oil companies are doing, whether there's any collusion involved or exactly what to keep prices high, because we know they have the capacity to produce more. Right. The United States is the biggest producer of oil and gas in the world. They have the capacity, they have been artificially keeping the prices high, so we really need to do more to put pressure on um, the oil companies to do that production. You know, we talked about Ukraine and the need for all of us to think about sacrificing for democracy right now. Well, the oil companies and the gas companies ought to be doing that too. You know, this is a, a patriotic um, need to respond to what's happening globally with the impact on energy prices because of what's happening with Russia. And I would hope that they would uh, take a look at the situation and be willing to help the American people and help the world provide the energy that we need. And uh, probably, as, as many of you know, uh, in a short-term way, I've proposed, uh, we've 
couple of my colleagues that we suspend the gas tax for the rest of the year. Um, that's 18 cents a gallon is 18 cents a gallon and it adds up uh, and the bill would direct Treasury to uh, backfill any losses to the highway fund so it wouldn't negatively impact the highway fund. Um, but to Gene's point, uh, there are thousands of unused permits that the oil companies have right now for production. Um, so um, this is something that they can solve uh, if they stand up to do it. Uh, so um, you know, we'll continue to push. And the other thing we'll continue to keep an eye on and push is uh, looking at the capacity of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve um, and pushing the administration to release more uh, from that reserve uh, in concert with our allies releasing more from their reserves so that we continue to increase the supply. Uh, a little conversation about money now, as I think you alluded to earlier, uh, Senator Shaheen. This is the largest investment really in our country infrastructurally in our lifetimes. So that's a lot of money, and with a lot of money comes, of course, you got to keep an eye on how people are handling it. So uh, the question is, what systems are in place to mitigate fraud with the distribution of federal funds to the states? Yeah, I think that's a really important question and one that... Um, that we need everybody's help on because there is an unprecedented amount of money that are coming is coming to states and communities. And we want to make sure that it's spent in the way that's most effective and efficient. That's why when I talked about the housing funding that's here for rental and mortgage assistance, it's frustrating to me that it's taking so long to get that money out um, because there's a need out there and we want to spend these dollars effectively. Um, there is someone in charge in Washington. Uh, the president has named former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, to head up the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, he was the mayor of New Orleans, as some of you may remember, during Hurricane Katrina, when um, he had to deal with not just that emergency, but the aftermath of that. So I think he is, um, He's very competent, and we had a chance to meet with him. Yep. Senator Hassan and I did um, several weeks ago, and he heard from a bipartisan group of us about the need to get this program implemented, but to do it in a way that is effective and efficient. And I think we will continue to monitor that and see that the dollars are going out and that they're being made good use of. And, and you, I, I think, heard the president speak uh, the other night about reinvesting in our inspector generals and oversight in the executive branch. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on the Homeland Security and Government Oversight Committee and chair of a committee that uh, oversees spending. And so uh, we are looking at making sure that not only do we have fully staffed inspector generals offices, um, uh, but also uh, the kind of skilled and talented <laughs> and independent people in those offices uh, to do this work and really um, alert Congress uh, when they are seeing um, either misused funds or uh, a level of opaqueness that makes it very hard to, to follow. Um, and so if we can reinvest in these professional independent um, inspectors general and let them have um, robust offices, uh, that will make a big difference too. But you know, we also need to see the state um and the state is participating in that, the, what was called the GOFER, the Governor's Commission. That group has a responsibility for spending the dollars effectively as well. So this is really a partnership. We need to work with, with the state, with local communities to ensure that the information goes out there, that people know what's available, that they can make good use of the dollars and then spend it well. So it's gonna be an ongoing challenge that um, as business leaders, I'm sure all of you will be involved in as well. We'll stay on transportation here for just a moment and we, we certainly want to address what all this means for Manchester Boston Regional Airport. My friend Ted Kitchens is with us today. He was on my radio program recently. We talked about how Great Spirit Airlines has meant as possibly an enticement incentive for other airlines to see that they're being successful. Maybe they should come and join the fund at MHT. So uh, how does all this impact the, uh, the airport traffic? Um, there certainly is uh, funding in the bill for uh, Manchester Regional Airport, and I don't know, um, Nick Malatesta from my office is on. Nick, do you want to speak to any of the specifics, if you can hear me? 
Uh, hi, Senator. I, I can hear you. Um, folks can hear me. Uh, yes, I'm great. Um, there's a, a you know, number of provisions in the airport, or excuse me, in the infrastructure bill. Um, I think the top line uh, funding is about $25 billion, um, and that's split amongst uh, that's in the airport improvement program. Uh, it's, a, it's a grant program. Um, that's a, you know, a source that the state often turns to for um, airport funding. Also, the law made some changes uh, to the TIFIA uh, grant program to allow for certain airport related projects uh, to qualify. Uh, so that, that's a, you know, another uh, sort of vector for um, airport improvement funds. And, and finally, there's um, the about $20 billion in, um, sorry, sorry, excuse me, $15 billion um, in funding, formula funding for uh, airport uh, programs. And you know, I'm happy to talk um, you know, in greater detail or at length than anybody who's interested in finding out some of the opportunities there. Uh, you know, we work closely with uh, Ted Kitchens uh, at Manchester on, on these um, you know, opportunities that are available there. Um, but I, you know, I, I should just mention that there are also improvements to FAA tower operations, which are critical for um, you know, both ensuring and growing the con con continuity of flights uh, at Manchester and throughout the region. Thanks, Nick. And I, I think the other thing I would add is if we can get the capital corridor done uh, and it can uh, connect in an effective way uh, to Manchester Regional Airport, uh, we have a whole new level of interest and capacity uh, for expansion there. And Ted is smiling, so that's a yeah, good sign. that's a good sign. Um, you know, I, I don't want to leave the Capital Corridor project issue, however, without pointing out the big challenge over the years. It was true when I was governor, way back when. It was true when Maggie was governor. The challenge is the state match. And until we're willing to make a commitment at the state level to provide the match for the federal dollars, it's going to be really impossible to get that done. So I know you all have been really active and have done a great job in advocating, but that's we got to put a focus on the state's got to be willing to step up and provide some funding for this if it's ever going to happen. And in order to, to make that happen, it's going to take all of you really um, making your voices heard. Senators, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the American Society of Civil Engineers. They do uh, report cards for infrastructure. And uh, New Hampshire has a C minus, but almost all of New England does. Only Vermont got a C. So uh, let's talk a little bit about bridges and the poor condition. 8% of our bridges here in this state are probably actually more than that. Uh, categorized in poor condition, we saw what happened in Pittsburgh the day that President Biden visited. It wasn't a tragedy because it wasn't during prime time, but it could happen. And we've seen it happen in Tampa, Minnesota. How is the Infrastructure uh, Program Investment and Jobs Act going to address that? Um, well, there's significant dollars in there just targeted for bridges. Um, there's also, uh, help me here, Ted, I think it's probably on here. Um, I think we've got about $40 billion just for bridges. Yes, yes so there's $40 billion for bridges. Um, and through a competitive program as well. Yeah, and there's also part of that is 12 and a half billion, which local communities can apply for, for bridges. So I was up in Guilford last summer where they've got um, a bridge um, that is really, um, they had to do major repairs in order to keep it operable. And of course, we want all the the roads and bridges operable during tourism season. So that was a big issue. But they could actually apply for funding under this um, separate bridge program in addition to what the state is doing. And as you all know, our State Department of Transportation is really good in New Hampshire. And um, so I had a chance to meet with Commissioner Sheehan. I think she, Maggie probably met with her as well yeah. this week when she was in Washington. And she is going to make the best use of every dollar that comes to the state and is working really hard to do that. Um, and this is a great opportunity to have funding separated into just bridges. We used to have, as part of the federal highway program, um, 
several reauthorizations ago, bridges were a separate fund, and that got discontinued, and it all, all the money got put in together. And that's been, I think, one of the challenges in helping get our bridges fixed. Um, so now we have a separate pot as part of this infrastructure bill. Yeah, and we're also, a, we are well positioned as a state in many ways because we do the 10-year tra transportation plan. A lot of other states don't have that process. So it does mean that uh, when money comes, we are in a good position not only to tell uh, the funders what we need, but also to manage it uh, because the work has been done. So um, it, it's an exciting time to be able to get those bridges fixed. Uh, the senators have uh, said they would stay till 1110, so we do have time for a few more questions as we've just gone past 11 o'clock. Thank you for that. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I think, I don't know for sure really, uh, I have transportation companies that are last mile. Let's see if we can figure out what he means by that. I've had my business's profitability hurt and limited by inflation of car parts and limited availability such as transmissions for three months. What leadership is Congress taking to change this paradigm? Uh, well, one of, the, one of the things we're doing is working on this supply chain bill. Uh, so that we do more of this manufacturing, uh, semiconductors for instance in particular, back here in the United States. Uh, what we passed last spring in the Senate was a bipartisan bill that focused on um, investing in research and development here at home in partnerships for instance with universities and the private sector, but also bringing manufacturing back here at home. Um, and so that is uh, something we continue to work on. The House passed their version of the bill. We're now putting together the two versions. Um, and I'm focused on getting grants and loans to manufacturers in these critical sectors like semiconductors, uh, like uh, biotech and defense tech um, and solar panels. Um, but in the, the other thing we need to do is make sure that the supply chains that we currently have are more efficient. Part of the answer here is getting through the pandemic and uh, getting people globally back to work. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're making progress there. Uh, part of it, though, is what this infrastructure bill is helping us with, which is making our overall infrastructure more efficient, which speeds goods to um, manufacturers, to suppliers, to purchasers more quickly. Um, expanding things like the Portsmouth Harbor Turning Basin so we can have bigger ships with more product on it. Um, and um, you know, all of this adds up. Uh, one of the provisions that I think Gene worked on the most in, in the uh, infrastructure bill was also uh, provisions to get more commercial truckers uh, on, on the road now uh, so that we can begin to address some of these supply challenges. Um, but it is a mix of um, a labor shortage and uh, production interruptions that uh, are pretty much directed directly uh, to the, uh, related directly to the pandemic. And we do have to continue to make our progress there and make sure that internationally uh, we're making progress against the pandemic and get people back to work. Yeah, we have a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers in this country right now. And I was up in Concord at the, uh, one of two commercial driving schools we have in, New Hampshire, um, one is in Concord, the other is White Mountains Community College in Littleton. And um, I was talking to the owner about the challenges of getting people licensed because in order to drive big rigs or even you know, um, for FedEx or whoever, you have to have a commercial license. And it's a real challenge because we don't have enough instructors. And so we were talking about what more we could do to try and support um, and encourage people to think about trucking. It's a, a different profession than it used to be. You don't have to go long haul, as he pointed out. You can, um, they have uh, set up so you don't have to spend so much time away from your families and the salaries are good. Um, one of the challenges is that um, we've had a rule that says you have to wait until you're 21 in order to cross state lines. Um, we did, we fixed that in the infrastructure bill, so in an effort to try and um, make sure if young people were interested in um, work in the trucking industry that they could do that right out of high school and get their um, certification. 
So we've got to also look at a number of these workforce issues that are really important. Um, one of the things we heard when we were down in um, Portsmouth meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers about the Turning Basin and the Piscataqua River was that there aren't enough companies out there who can do the work that we need. So we've got all of these dollars coming that are going to help us um, make these investments and we don't have enough people to do the job. So one of the things we've got to look at, and this is where I'm sure all of you have ideas for what we could do, we've got to look at how we can encourage workforce training in particular areas where we have real deficits and we need people um, because that's critical if we're going to get get done the investments yeah. that we need. And, and I would just add on the, um, the supply chain bill that we are working on right now that I've been talking about, uh, that uh, the, the bipartisan effort that passed the Senate last spring and, and now we're working on details with the House includes um, a couple of bills that uh, bipartisan bills that I've been working on on workforce. Um, it, as governor, I heard about it from you all. Uh, one of the things we have is uh, a provision called Gateways to Careers, which helps people with post-secondary or secondary uh, or college training, uh, but it allows them to do it while they're also working and gives them supports around things like healthcare or housing or transportation so uh, that when people get a job, they can actually keep a job and have the kind of skills that you all need. We have some really good pilots in New Hampshire that we've worked on, as you all know, with community colleges and business organizations to train people up. Uh, but there are other things we can do too. So there's another provision that we're looking to try to get into this next package. For instance, it would allow people to use Pell Grants to cover uh, high quality um, trades training um, or advanced manufacturing training so that we are really uh, letting people uh, use resources to really train them up to the skill sets that, that we all know are, are, um, are lacking right now. Um, but the other thing is we, we gotta get people back to work. Um, and one of the things that is a real challenge, I mean, we've created, what, six and a half million jobs in the last year, uh, re replaced an awful lot of the jobs that were lost uh, at the height of the pandemic. Uh, but we know that there are a lot of women still out of the workforce because of the cost of childcare and because of the instability of the childcare system that we have that really uh, was made even more fragile um, with the pandemic. Um, and so figuring out how to lower the cost of childcare and support people who want to be uh, childcare workers um, is gonna be a critical um, issue moving forward as well. And the state has almost $30 million in discretionary child care dollars that they have not spent yet. Yeah. So all of you in chambers, ask the state what they're doing with those dollars because we need them to go out to people who need, need help with child care. Yeah. And our final question before we, uh, we let you go and make your closing comments. Uh, uh, you mentioned Fort Smith and the Piscataqua and all that. We have, what, 17, 18 miles of ocean frontage here in the great... 18, come on, 18. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't hedge on that number. Wow. Yeah. Rough room. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, question, what about the impacts of climate change, cyber attacks, and extreme weather events? Because it, it will affect us here to some degree. Um, well, a, a couple of things. One of the provisions that I worked on um, specifically in this bill was money for coastal resiliency um, and uh, really, really important to help our coastal communities protect themselves from the impact of climate change and uh, restore um, their communities when they are impacted by severe weather events. So uh, overall, um, about a uh, billion dollars in funding for coastal resiliency in this infrastructure package, some of which uh, it, it comes through programs that New Hampshire has a good track record with in terms of applying for grants. Um, the other thing that, um, there are two other provisions in the infrastructure bill that I would draw your attention to. One is $73 billion for resilient clean energy grid. Um, it's a major, major step forward, both to have a grid that can withstand things like wind and ice storms um, and extreme heat and fires, but also to make sure that it's a grid that can accept clean energy sources uh, as its fuel. So um, that's a major development in the, in the bill. And lastly, uh, there are provisions in the bill that I worked on, um, on for cyber grants for state and local communities. 
Uh, one of the successes we've had in the last year was a bipartisan bill that uh, provides a cyber coordinator in every state federally funded. New Hampshire now has one. That person's job is to work with state, local, and private sector uh, to make sure that everybody's sharing information and aware of uh, threats that may come their way and what they need to do to combat those cyber threats. Um, but it's also important that we, they actually have the dollars to improve uh, their cybersecurity. So there's a grant program in the infrastructure bill to help state and local communities do that. And I hope people will take advantage of it. Yeah, and these are all long-term efforts, but the bill, as I said, um, has seven and a half billion for charging stations to help us get on to electric vehicles, um, funding for um, alternative fuels for buses, um, funding for pedestrian and low emission transportation choices, um, the whole man's tra mass transit piece, and then the, in addition to all of the um, electric grid um, funding that's in there, the funding to help with energy efficiency is really designed to look long term at how do we, how do we diversify where we're getting our energy, what we're using our energy for. And, um, so significant dollars there that will help us be less dependent on fossil fuels over the long term. Well, we've gone just a little bit over our time. I'd like to give you the opportunity, if you wish, for closing comments to wrap it up uh, however you would do so. Well, I would just say thank you to all of you. Thank you for what you're doing in your communities and for getting through the pandemic. Um, Hopefully we are on this side of it now in a way that is gonna be good for your business and good for all of our communities. And thank you for um, all of the leadership you provide, but also for all of your efforts to try and help people be more aware of what's happening in your communities and what can be done. And I hope that you will stay in touch with our office, with Senator Hassan's office, if you have specific questions about grant programs or um, areas where you're not sure if there's funding to help with that, because that's um, gonna be a big piece of what we're gonna try and do as this um, infrastructure package rolls out to make sure that all of you and um, your community leaders know what's there and what they can make use of. So thank you, and thank you, Mike and Donna and all of the chambers. Yeah, just a, a, a big thanks as well for me uh, to all of you uh, for everything you've done. Um, before the pandemic, you were leading in your communities. During the pandemic, your leadership was even more essential. And um, I'm really, really grateful. And like Jean, I, I hope we are on the, the full other side of this. We certainly now know that we have uh, testing and treatment capacity along with the continued vaccination capacity uh, that should really help us uh, just keep moving forward. The infrastructure bill um, is really about laying uh, the foundation for a new economy, a 21st century economy where America can lead. Um, and that's really what this is all about. Uh, when you unleash the talent and energy and potential of every American, when we bring out the best in each other, there's nothing we can't do. And this really is about the foundation for that. There's obviously more work to do. Uh, we got a lower cost for people. Uh, we, we talked about oil prices, oil and gas prices, prescription drugs, and other issue childcare. We talked about a little bit. But then we also uh, know that on the issue of supply chains and competitiveness, uh, we need to make some critical investments to be self-sufficient as Americans and to be able to lead. And that's what uh, the next chapter is about. So thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Do stay in touch with our offices. We are here to help with uh, grant applications, with understanding the details and, and of these provisions. Um, but we just really, really appreciate uh, everything you do, your leadership in your communities. It makes the Granite State uh, the wonderful place it is. Thanks. Join me in thanking our Senator Shaheen and Hassan. All right.